All right, g'day and welcome to True Footy Podcast 44. And today I'm joined by yet another guest. We've had a, a, like a, a massive rush of guests suddenly on the True Footy Podcast. But today I'm joined by my friend Christian. Uh, how are you today, Christian? I'm good. Aside from it being 41 or it feels like 45 degrees here in Perth, I'm bloody good actually. How are you? Yes, very well. Thank you. I'm, I'm similarly sweltering as well. When did you get to Perth? Because you're based in Sydney, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I got in yesterday morning and a meeting was greeted with just like the furnace that is Perth. And I was like, oh, I remember this. This is pretty good. So no, it's really good to be here. As you can see, it's, I'm in a place where my Fremantle jersey actually makes sense. And I don't walk around Sydney and everyone's like, what the hell is that guy wearing? That's from the Cronulla Sharks jersey. I don't know what the hell that is. That kind of actually resembles AFLX. Uh, yeah, was that AFLX, you know, with the weird teams? I, like- I wish to this day, one of my great regrets in life is not having bought a Fife's Flyers jersey. Because, <laughs> man, imagine that in 20 years and everyone be like, what the hell is that? Wait, thing? is that a Fife Flyers or is that a Fremantle this Indigenous? Is, yeah, it's their Indigenous one. Yeah, okay, this okay. Year. So, yeah. fun fact, I'm a little bit of an amateur jersey collector and I have every single Indigenous jersey that Frio have ever made. Wow. In fact, I got really mad this year because... They wore this version in white, but didn't put it on sale. And I was just like, Ouch. it's the one I'm never going to never gonna own. But the worst thing I did recently, I realized I had a problem, is there was a guy in America who had a 2005 Fremantle away jersey with long sleeves Damn. that he somehow just had. That's rare. And I managed to get it shipped over here. <laughs> now I own it. And I was just like, this cost a lot of money. <laughs> probably have a problem with this. I Damn. Need to calm it down. Yeah. That's actually really impressive. Thanks. Yeah. Nice. My, my fiance doesn't think so. I'm glad that you <laughs> and the viewers at home do. Yep. That's good. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, well, I should actually give you a proper introduction, uh, Christian, because um, lately, as viewers and listeners of the True Footy Podcast have noticed, we've get, been getting guests, um, a st- a distinguished guests uh, from the AFL creator community. And Christian here is um, the owner of a, a very good podcast, I will say. I've been a guest on it twice, and uh, I must say it's really impressive every time I listen to it as well. Uh, it's called the Ruck Rover Podcast. Um, go check it out on Spotify. Uh, are you on Spotify? Or is it we're just on Spotify. Like, we're on yeah, everything. You're right? on everything. Cool, man. So uh, why don't you tell us, uh, for those who are listening or watching who may not have heard of the Ruck Rover Podcast, why don't you tell us a little bit about your show? Totally. So the Ruck Rover is a podcast, sort of. We're trying to do it in the model of the American podcasts around NBA. I'm a big footy fan and also an NBA fan around those ones like the Low Post, uh, around the BS podcast and things like that. So it is discussing not only the games that happen, but any sort of weird, uh, cool, different part of the game each week. So it's a podcast that comes out weekly and I always have a different guest on every single week. So we have our sort of cast of regulars and then anyone else who is doing interesting work in the space or has an interesting channel like yourself or interesting opinions can come on and sort of talk not only about the games gone by, but sort of the big issues around the game as well. And it's nice because I get to sit sort of in the middle as the host and then have all kinds of different people each week all bringing different, either different teams they support and stuff like that. To the table, so it's pretty cool to have you on a bunch of times. Well, I think we did all Australians, yeah, we did twice too. as well, which was really really fun. And it's nice also to sit here like this because this is actually the first podcast I've ever done with someone actually in the room. Because being in <laughs> Sydney, and there aren't too many AFL fans, let alone those who are making content. Everything I do is across Skype. I'm calling the Bev Show in Tasmania. I'm calling you over here. And it's nice to actually sit down and actually interact with someone in person. It's pretty good. But yeah, yeah that's, our, that's our podcast. We've got some plans next year. We want to pivot to a bit of video like yourself and kind of diversify across different mediums and stuff like that. Are you thinking about YouTube as I'm one of those mediums? thinking definitely about yeah. YouTube. This is my first sort of experiment with being on camera. I hope <laughs> it's not too awful. But uh, yeah, so again, some of those, um, not only inspiration like yourself, but some of those American shows like... NBA desktop, slow news day with Kevin Clark. They do really cool stuff with video in ways that I would never have thought of. And so I'm trying to figure out now over summer what is what's something that we can add that's different to the landscape that's not just doubling up on people like yourself and others who are already doing other stuff super well. So, yeah. yeah. That's cool, man. So when yeah, because I remember when you um had invited me onto the show, I admittedly didn't wasn't aware of the show up until that point, but did a little bit of research and there's a couple of things I really like about your show, uh, more than a couple of things, but I'll name the couple of things right now. <laughs> and I, me being on there is one of those. Yeah, so the second one. <laughs> yeah those are my two favorite episodes. <laughs> no, um, obviously I like how you get a lot of different guests on a little perspective, a uh, little different perspectives. You've got a lot of um, 
like for instance you contacted me because i'm sort of already in this space you contacted the bev who's also sort of well known was there any kind of like was that difficult as an obstacle for you to sort of get it might sound lame but get the courage to contact people because for instance i've been doing this for two years and i had my first guest on the podcast three weeks ago and i've done you're the third of which now um but i must admit there's, there's always been a part of me that's kind of just been a little bit nervous to actually get people on but so was that like awkward for you at all to try and contact like the Bev, who is really well known, for instance. Um. Yeah, it, it really was. I was pretty nervous to do it because I sort of had my group of friends and former writers I'd worked with on other platforms. And I was like, yeah, oh, I'll just hit them up. And then I looked at my list and I was like, that's only like six people. Like I can't <laughs> recycle the same six people over and over again. And the main thing, I didn't know how it was going to go because for all I knew, this was like a really established community of creators and they were just going to tell me to rack off and they already had enough on their plate as it was. But I was so surprised at how welcoming people were in that. And that gave me a lot of courage once the first one sort of came down and someone said, absolutely, I'd love to do it. Gave me the courage to keep going back to different people and things like that as well. So there have been people who have said no, but never in a bad way and never Mm -hmm. rude. But yeah, it was a bit of a challenge to start with. I didn't know what I was going to be met with. Um, But now that it's happened, I think it's great. It'll give me more and more courage to reach out to future people like... You know, you mentioned people you've had on this pod as well already who I've been following their stuff forever as well when I dived into this world and figure out who was doing what. And now I'd love to reach out to them and see if they want to come on as well. Yeah. Yeah. Good call. We did have the pair on last week. So I'll just plug that episode. Go check it out. It's the most recent. He is fantastic. So I'm going to be sliding into your DMs very, (laughs) very soon. So get excited for that. He's a good fella, Anthony. Yeah. Um, the other good, the other thing that I really like about your show is that you, it's a really smart strategy, your content strategy in the sense that, um, talking about football, like we do on here week to week, it's, it's double edged because it's good because the content sort of makes itself for us in terms of what we can talk about as creators. Um, like at true footy, I do a video once a week tipping my, my footy tips and then, it, you know, it's very easy for me. Um, however, the downside to that is that the next week it's old news. Do you know what I mean? So there's the shelf life of our content um, in this general space. It's very hard to maintain. However, with yours, what I really like is that you kind of pick a story, like you said, and you deep dive it. For instance, I think one of my favorite episodes was the one where you guys deep dive like the Western Bulldogs premiership a couple years after yeah, the fact. Yeah. And that's just something that anyone can tune into like months or years after you've recorded the actual episode and go back to. And you did one deep diving the Derby rivalry during Derby week and stuff like that. Um, is there a particular episode or guest that you particularly remember fondly? Do you have a favorite or is it all kind of equal? That's a really good question. Um, I did love doing the Western Bulldogs rewind because the guy I had on is my mate, Alex Walters, aka the wing dog, shout out Alex, uh, who we used to run a sports and pop culture website here called The Yarn. That was probably around like 2013, 2014. And him and I were just working these dead end jobs, doing nothing, straight out of uni, had no idea what we wanted to do. And we just said, let's make a sports website as we would want it to be. And we had a great time doing that. And we love just like big narratives, big, just like overarching. As Dockers fans, both of us, we're like so long suffering that we can just go in on any of that sort of stuff. And to have watched the Bulldogs flag in real time and all the obstacles they had to overcome for that podcast i probably did more research than for any other one like i actually went back and watched all four of those games from like start to finish just to actually remember what the commentators were saying at various times who they thought was going to have a good game but actually didn't because caleb daniel came out of nowhere against the west coast and blew them apart for some reason that was a fond memory for me oh very (laughs) fun (laughs) yeah and um yeah i loved that one because not only was that sort of with one of my best friends and content creator, but it was something we actually felt passionate about. Because as Dockers fans, we hope for that one day to happen to us, mm. like go on some magical run that we've never been on before and to relive that every single moment. I think it's like the most pure like footy story that I've ever encountered in my time watching, you know what I mean? It's like total rags to riches, coming from seventh to win the flag. Bob Murphy being out for the entire time and lifting the cup at the end. Tom Boyd, so maligned through his career and kicking that goal to seal the game. I mean, it's got so much to it. And so while we were doing it, I was getting excited reliving it with him. That was a really, really fun one. I really love that. The other one I liked is um, 
Alex Smith, who's also in Perth, did one about the salary cap. And he was teaching mm. me things on air mm. that I didn't know about how live trading worked and how champion data holds their you know, data back from us. So we can't actually figure out who is a good player and who yeah. isn't. And it's blowing my mind oh, really? on air as I'm trying to keep it together as the host. <laughs> That one was super fun too. So if you ever need an education in that, check that one out. It was really good. That's awesome. You know what other ones I like? The ones where you get your brother on. Yeah. Oh, Nick, Nick is a lot of fun. <laughs> Nick is great because he is just salty as hell. He's a funny time. man. He He's is. a funny man. I think he. we ended up titling the episode he was on most recently, Why Melbourne Fans. As in... The, the city of Melbourne are ruining the AFL. Like he just comes in there and he's in Montreal at the moment. So he gets on the podcast super late at night and super early, really, really grumpy and just starts shooting from the hip on all kinds of topics. And yeah, I really enjoy having him on. It's really nice as I'm sure you have when you have a guest on and I'm sure you have with Busher and all the other people, like you already know each other yeah, and you get that easy connection. And sometimes, you know, I'd always be nervous. Some of the guests I had on, I haven't really met them before. We've talked over text about what mm. we're going to talk about, but until you actually sit opposite them or opposite a screen and build that you know, banter and stuff like that, you don't know how it's going to go. That's and true. so every time I have Nick on, it's like a total fail safe. We can just like go off the rails, talk about whatever. But yeah, he's a lot of fun to have on. I think my favorite one-liner that he said um, that stayed with me is that um, – I think it was something about BT and Robbo being in the same room. And he's like, and it's where high intensity stupid meets low intensity stupid. I just thought that is just a perfect summation of those two people. It's so good. He lifted this other one he said on there, but this is from someone else. I can't remember who said it, but yeah. it was something like um, Basil Zempler speaks like Dennis Cometti with a concussion. And I thought that is so funny. Wow. That's yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, he sounds like he might be actually a natural talent for podcasting and is there any chance he could come on as like a co-host? You just said he was in Montreal. I guess that's probably an obstacle. Yeah, it's sort of just that that distance that divides and things like that. And I think he he likes coming on for those short, sharp bursts because he is someone who needs to gather up a lot of time. You know, like some people can do it like you. Every single week, they're thinking of content, they're pushing it out. Uh, even if there isn't a story that week, hopefully people like you and I, we can make a mm. story, you know, Accident at training, let's talk about that, and soft tissue injuries. He really wants to go big things when he wants to do it. So while I'd love to have him on more and more, I know he wants to come on and really talk about everything at once. He doesn't <laughs> want to do like that week to week to week grind. He's yeah. a certain kind of person who tunes in every single week to find content. When sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, you're in the middle of July yeah. and every footy game is boring and means nothing and you're just like, oh man, yeah. what are you talking <laughs> I don't know, Toby Green, yeah. maybe push someone. Let's, <laughs> let's get into that. Let's talk about Toby, that sort of thing. I feel that. I feel that. That's funny. Um, yeah, so like you said, this is the first time we've met, even though we've done two podcasts together. And I have actually made an observation. So you're a very good speaker when you're we're in podcast mode. Appreciate that. But in the 10 minutes or whatever we spoke before starting this podcast, I noticed that you're exactly the same whether there's a microphone <laughs> turned on or not. Like in terms of your charisma and the way you speak, do you have a background in like journalism journalism or media? or Because you, your brother's the same, I noticed. You just both seem very natural for this, this yeah. speaking thing. We have... No, we don't. We have backgrounds in theatre. Yeah, right. Acting and stuff like okay. that. Okay, so, so well, that makes a, sense. Yeah, for a brief time when I was young... I used to do, I was in like Shakespeare in the Park over in King's Park for a bit and, you know, uh, did all the plays at university and stuff like that. So I was a pretty timid kid and it was really some of my mates got into drama and said, you know, you got to get in on this with us. It's a lot of fun. And I did. And that's the only, I reckon that's the only reason why I cultivated like being able to present and to speak and being comfortable speaking in front of everyone. I think my dad also, you know, he was in TV and stuff like that. And he's Canadian. Yeah. So we've got like oh. some pretty strange accents and there's some like weird kind of meshing going on there. But yeah, I put it all down to those years, you know, being on stage and being an actor and stuff like that. It just wow. gave me that confidence and that, especially that like enunciation and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Just very Which lends itself it. well to... To podcasting, I think, yeah. But you're a lawyer too, aren't you? Yeah, Another so thing I'm an admitted lawyer. That uh, law, I'm admitted on the roll here. That's gathering dust. I'm not really <laughs> not really using it. But, you know, my hex debt says that I definitely did it. So that's right up I've, there. I'm the same. I've got a law degree as well that I haven't used yet. So <laughs> <laughs> here we are doing a footy podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> um, but, yeah, did, did study law while I was doing all the drama and stuff like that. And then um, sort of had that moment where I had to realize whether I was going to stay in Perth 
and do law. And that was when, you know, I was doing the yarn and other sports sort of things. And then ended up just moving to Sydney with no job and just wanted to change. And so just went into completely different, like swam in different waters there and stuff like that. But I nearly didn't go to Sydney because I was nearly offered a job at the Fremantle Dockers. Wow, they needed a full forward, didn't they? Yeah, they did, man. They needed someone who's five foot nine, a full forward with no hammies. And they were like, I think you're our guy. Um, Nah, so I, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do and we were doing the yarn and, you know, but everyone was moving on to do jobs and stuff like that. So all my contributors were dropping off and I was like, yeah, maybe this is the end of it. And then I'd all booked, I booked my flight to go to Sydney. I was like, now I'm moving. Even if there's no job, I'm going over there. I'm going to figure out what's going to happen and stuff like that. And my mate and I, Caleb McKenna, who's also been on the pod, we used to write a footy web series called Four Quarters, which got made with Screen Australia money. And it was like a week to week thing there. So I was writing footy jokes every week for this weekly show. And that was really, really fun. We were like 24, 25. He was younger, like 22 when we were doing it. And so I thought I was going to be a writer in Sydney. So I was going to go that way. But there was this job to be a content creator for Frio. And I was like, I got to apply. It was like a flat 50 grand, you know, like... Not a huge amount, but I was like, I'm definitely applying. And I went through the entire process and they were like, you're down to the final person. And I was like, I want to fly to Sydney. You've got to let me know wow. what's going on. I remember going for interviews and stuff. And I walked down there and like Ross Lyons just walk in the boundary. And I'm sitting in the waiting room with wow. the Western Derby Cup and everything up there and stuff like that. And they, I mean, everyone gave them a lot of hassle for moving to Coburn, which I get, you know, it's away from Frio, blah, blah, blah. Mm. I did my interview in a shipping container in the parking lot because they did not have any space to put us. So, like, I did a writing task. Like, yeah, come on through to our main office. We walk out into the parking lot into a shipping container where all this makeshift office is set up. I was like, what is happening out here? So you can see why they needed to move somewhere bigger. But, yeah, as I was in the waiting room, to get on my flight, they called me and said that I didn't get it. They went with some other bloke. You're kidding. Who had done, um, like he, well, he'd been out in, um, I think, Kalgoorlie or something like that, doing like years of okay. community um, journalism. So he was way more qualified. But sure. I kind of liked that in the end because I didn't want to make the decision of whether I was going to yeah. stay or go and it just made it for me. Yeah. But yeah, it was fun walking around and seeing Ross Lyon stalking the boundary line of Frio Oval as I'm like going in for an interview and stuff <laughs> like that. It was fun. Yeah, right. Wow, that, that's actually really interesting. I feel like I feel like I missed out on a gem there, so it's their loss, mate. <laughs> oh, totally, man. I could have been there with a mic in Ten Diamonds on Goose yeah. face being like, so you lost the grand final, yeah. what was that like? <laughs> that's true, fun. that's true. Um, so, how do we get from um, a former actor, qualified lawyer, um, guy who moves to Sydney, missed out on a Frio Media job, to now a Ruck Rover podcaster? Um, starting, you started your podcast. It was 2019, wasn't it? Yeah, last yeah. year was the first year. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, how did that? How did you actually? Um, what was the genesis to use your own term? Yeah, <laughs> me using wanky terms. Uh, I just love. I just love it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I kind of I worked different jobs in Sydney, and I came to the end of one, and my fiance and I decided, or well, my then girlfriend, now fiance, decided we were going to pack up our house and go to South America. We're just going like, to have a total change and figure out what we wanted to do next. Uh, and I was sitting over there and I was sort of just trying to write a list of like what I actually liked and what I loved in the world. And just top of the list was just sport. It was NBA, it was footy, it was cricket. I loved talking about it. I liked writing about it. And more than anything, I loved going to games and experiencing it. And I was like, well, if that's the top of the list and I'm doing nothing in my current life that leads me anywhere towards that, like how are we going to flip that up? And so I started doing research into like what niche I could kind of have in the AFL space. I thought I'd start there because it's what I know the most. Because I don't want to do an NBA one or anything like that because there are guys who are already doing that really, really well and have been following it their whole lives. There are lots of people in AFL who are doing it really, really well, like yourself as well. But at least I can be like, yeah, I was following it since the 90s. I know who all these players are. Like yeah. you, you feel like you've got the base. It's also still very much an open market. It's very, we're still yeah. like, it's still in its infancy. These in, indie creators, um, totally. So. And they and now I see they're forming their own community. Yeah, it's great. Speaking to each other, which is really cool. But yeah. I was an outsider there, and I just realised, a, I'll start the podcast because I'd done a podcast before. My brother and I had one called "When You Were Young," which lasted a glorious eight episodes, <laughs> um, which was me and my brother recording. Uh, reviewing things from our childhoods like the first episode was like a Goosebumps book which we both read and stuff like that and reviewed that and I was like well I have all the gear already from that and why don't I start there and just see my main thing for the first year was like just do it every week just see if you can do the grind of like 28 episodes 
in a row and then judge after that. Now that I've done that, I really want to go around again in 2020 and hopefully beyond. But yeah, it was just like, I wrote that at the top of the list. Like that's what I love the most. And since I wasn't doing anything to get any closer to that, I was just like, we got to start somewhere. So I started calling out my friends who I'd done podcasts with before and said, do you want to be on this? And they said, yeah. And we just kind of went from there. Nice. Cool. So I actually, I love that story about um, what made you like decide what was important in life and why you started the podcast and stuff like that. It's quite similar to my own. I'm sort of coming to the end of my degree, degrees um, uh, in 2017. And, um, and then, yeah, Joycey sort of floated the idea of doing this podcast. And then since we started it, I've realized I just, it makes me really happy and, and it's just sort of given me a whole new lease on life. Um, and for me, like, I must admit, I'm quite ambitious with it. I, I would love to see it transition into a career. I don't know exactly what that would look like, but at the moment, my attitude is to just grind and grind and see where it takes me. Would you like to be on, you know, have this grow to a point when it's your own company or would you like to eventually sort of you and the boys kind of get plucked and say, now you're on the, you're the equivalent of the front bar or something like that. If you had a choice between either one of those, do you want to go to the big boys in that sense or build your own competitor that sort of competes with them? I I think about that as well. Sometimes. I love that question. I, uh, I think I would probably rather do my own thing um, and stay independent. I'd like to be unfiltered and with what I can say, like, um, there's, a, there's a point where you can't be too unfiltered. We, we've really reined it back on all the things we used to say. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we did a New Year's podcast two years ago. It's really pretty bad. <laughs> okay. Kevin Spacey references, it's terrible. Oh, so, you go, so you're going to get cancelled. We're yeah. going to bring those back up. No, again. I've already said it to Unlisted. So. Okay, so I can't wait to cancel <laughs> yeah. Jesse and the gang. It's going to be really fun. Um, but to answer your question, I don't actually really have a passion or like real ambition to be in like AFL media as it is, mainstream media uh, or anything like that. I kind of love the idea of just doing um, doing this as like a full-time YouTuber and being independent. Of course, the downside of that is um, how stable is that financially? And obviously, there's a ceiling in this little um, AFL sort of scene. But it'd be nice to be like one of the first people who do it. And even if that means I have to, I have to work a part-time job for the rest of my 20s while I do this, you know, I really enjoy that. But the this is a long-winded way of asking you what is your vision for the rut rover podcast is it something you'd like to sort of really monetize and make a big thing or is it always going to be a passion project for you and you you won't necessarily do it full time it's a really good question and the honest answer is i'm not sure at this stage i i would always like it to be more than a passion project that's one thing i do know i would love to have some way to bring in money or do it more often or do it better with resources behind it, anything like that. At the moment, I think more than anything, it's trying to be proof of concept, not only for me to show like, hey, I could do this if you wanted me to be on a radio more or be on a show more. That's probably the minimum I would like it to be at. But if it could be a situation where it eventually became, like the guys I idolize, as I say, are people like The Ringer, who are this content side in America who do all kinds of different sports and pop culture and everything. They have this great staff of writers who are just constantly being like the funniest, creative, best version of what sports content can be. You know, they like, they cover songs and do video clips for fake, you know, all this kind of stuff. And their stuff on socials are awesome. Their show NBA Desktop just won a sports Emmy. And really all it is is like one camera on the main guy and then a screenshot of his desktop computer as he clicks through links. And it's so funny because he's so funny. <laughs> yeah, That's probably the, the best version of what I would love it to become. I'd love to have a, a, star, a small staff of people who are all just like the best creatives possible. And we just every week try kill it with the funniest, insightful content that we can. But at the moment, I just needed to be, can this person have a unique take on footy? I'm not sure I'm quite there yet, but I'm certainly working towards trying to make that happen yeah that's cool yeah. How, how would you find it workload wise because obviously you work as do i do you it's do you tough. feel like you're ba- burning the candle at both ends because i felt really good probably uh i went away to europe in july took july off came back was doing like five videos a week absolutely loved it loved doing it but as soon as the trade period ended i just hit this wall and at the moment i'm absolutely flat as attack with it which is probably why like i'm not doing that, as many videos but how do you feel like your workload at the moment is sustainable and i'm kind of asking this mostly for myself because yeah. i don't get to speak to other creators in this space that much but it's really cool to hear another person's perspective so 100 like, to be honest i'm shattered i was yeah. like I, I as i say i have i hadn't done this before i had to get my reps in so i started really early in the season 
And my thing, as I said, I was like, you got to do this every week. That's my mission. Quality, I hope it's quality, but I have to do it every week to show that I can do it. And then I had all this thing. I was like, I was going to do a summer series and I was going to start to experiment with video. I have not done a thing <laughs> since my grand final rap. Yeah. I've just, I've just had to stop for a second and I need to gear up again. Now that I know what that grind is like, mm. when we kick off again in February or whatever it is, I have to be ready for it to go for a long time. And the thing I admire most about you is the fact that you're able to do multiple content pieces per week. That I found the hardest part. Because it's one thing to get yourself up for the game and to do one thing a week and you kind of pull it all together. But if you're doing multiple touch points that all have to be quality and all have to be engaging, I don't know how you do that. Because me doing the one a week, uh, and sometimes I cheated a little bit and would record maybe one or two I had in the bag, you know what I mean? That I could roll out on a week when I was going to be away one weekend Mm. or I couldn't watch every single game. I think that watching the games is a big part. Yeah. Because it's one thing to watch highlights and stuff like that, but the really good people, like you know, you're watching games, you're able to actually say, in this moment, this was happening, it was really interesting, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Huge time suck. That's right. That's probably the hardest thing. I think you nailed it. The hardest point is getting across all the games, and that's why KO, um, my subscription to KO has probably been the biggest plus for this channel. Oh, absolutely. KO is great. KO is awesome. Exactly, exactly. Pay me, KO. Pay me lots of money. I'll talk about you. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, I think... um, I uh, I think my sort of, not secret, but the way I sort of was able to produce lots of content, I kind of batch produced it. So like I'd have a day off from work. And that's what's good about Bunnings, working at Bunnings is that I have the flexibility. So I get work the occasional weekend, get a couple of days off in the week. And that, that balance just really helps me. Um, sure. So I can just spend a whole Thursday afternoon ba- making about four or five videos and, and like <coughs> batch producing it. That's probably been the biggest plus. Um, but... We've, we've talked about this this sort of stuff quite a lot in this podcast. Um, sure. A little more than I'd planned, but as I said, I find it really interesting. One thing I do kind of want to meander toward is your passion for that um, hideous jumper that you're wearing <laughs> and, uh, and your love for Fremantle. So you've always, you were a Perth boy originally, despite living overseas. What, uh, just as a little segue, um, did you ever live in Canada? Yeah, so my dad's Canadian. I went on exchange there, so I yeah, spent right. a bit of time there, and I was just in Toronto where he's from recently in November last year. So actually this time last year, yeah. I was there and I watched a bunch of Raptors games. I'm a big Raptors fan. They won the championship recently. It was awesome. But yeah, so I've spent a little bit of time, especially in Toronto. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Um, but with your with regard to your free man of love, is that something that's sort of, a lot for a lot of people, like, I wish I had a cool story than saying my family go for the Eagles and I go for the Eagles. Um, and then some, occasionally you get the opposite where people are like, oh, my family all went for the Eagles, so I go for Fremantle. But is there any sort of like depth to the story? Is it kind of just like you're just a Oh, it's a little, it's a little bit of a yarn. So dad is Canadian, moved over to Canberra originally when he first came here and then went to Perth. I don't know why he did that. It was like Sydney and Melbourne. He was just like, nah, screw it. I'll just go to Canberra and Perth instead. Like weird flex, but look good on him. Uh, and mom grew up in Kalgoorlie and she wasn't a footy fan. She loved cricket. She loved cricket so, so, so much. Didn't really care about footy. And then moved to Perth. She met my dad who'd moved over and they settled in East Fremantle on Allen Street where the Shark Park is. All right. So we were East Frio fans, kind of. But, you know, the Eagles came in, the AFL, they didn't really care. Yeah, they didn't okay. have anything to do with them. And then the moment that we got a team, that it was the Fremantle Dockers, my dad, there was a, there was a game that was played, an exhibition match. Fremantle versus Essendon at Shark Park. I must have been five, six, whatever it is. And dad took me and my brother. I like, walked down the street. I remember walking in. There's no one ever in Shark Park. Like yeah. I used to run laps around there to try and get fit. And I would see Byron Shammer and Ryan Crowley running laps the other way. You know, like you just walk in there. No one cared. Yeah. And then we walked in and it was packed full of people. Absolutely rammed. And Fremantle were playing Essendon and they won that exhibition game and my dad bought, which I still have, well actually I've got Nick's, my brother's one, bought like a little Fremantle hat which says, I'd like to see that stitched into here. It's like the most 90s thing ever. It's wicked. And he gave us that and then we were just like 100% all in as a family. We never really went to the games. That wasn't a big part of it, but like we would all come back to the family home. Mum would make pies and we all just went all in on Fremantle from then because we lived in that suburb and we got given our own team. That's that's how it started. And then every year I just kept doubling and doubling down. So I was always a Fremantle fan 
but it was really in 2006 I took a year off. I didn't know what I was doing with my life. How did you take like, that year off as a Fremantle fan? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> man, it's a tough, tough time. And then I remember my parents had Foxtel and they had Fox footy. And so for the first time, I had nothing to do, nowhere to be. I wasn't employed. And I just started watching every single game nice. and learning every single thing about every single player. And that was the time I really loved like the whole game, I guess. Yeah, but before yeah. that, I was always in on, on Frio because mm. we, we lived there and grew up with it. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. You do kind of flirt with a GWS sort of following, don't Shout you? Shout out to my boys, GWS. Is your brother yeah. kind of the same as well? I've yeah, got... we just love a scrappy team who's yeah. like a little brother, you know what I mean? And yeah. so I thought that could... might have been because you were in Sydney. Yeah, it was, but yeah. We, we liked them beforehand even. Yeah. So they just kind of came in. and like I like a team who no one gives any respect to. Fair I'm enough. starting to pivot weirdly towards loving the Suns. Yeah, yeah. Because I just, have it, I just don't like the big established Victorian clubs who just crap on everyone and talk yep. about how great they are like Carlton I'm yeah, like, bro yeah. you guys have been crap for 20 years <laughs> like you have nothing to be proud of right now in my entire time of loving footy yeah but I and so they came in and everyone was like they're gonna fail no one's gonna want to stay there and they're out west and yeah so I just respect it a lot like they just had this task of building this thing from the ground up They've got like a super like working class kind of cool roots. I like how their jumper, they, even though I don't like their jumper, yeah. they tried to design to be like to look like tradies and stuff like that. I'm like, it's a cool concept behind right. all of it. And the more and more everyone just told them that they sucked and would fold as a club, the more and more I was just all in on them. And the best thing is living in Sydney, you can just go out there for no money and just watch quality AFL footy games and just sit boundary side. And you can hear Heath Shaw like barking at everyone. It feels like a waffle game. Oh, that's cool. And I love that. But the coolest thing about it is when we were there for the GWS Bulldogs final. Mm. So I was actually there in the crowd. And for the first time, I saw that place just rocking. There is was, this this year or a couple no, of years ago? No, I was there this year, but yeah. in 2016, sorry, yeah. I mean. So yeah, the prelim. Yeah which I think wow. Seven said it was the best game of footy of the decade. Yeah. And it's a 20,000-seat stadium. I've been in there where there's been 5,000 people. Wow, And yeah. this was 20,000 people, half Bulldogs, half GWS. Wow. Both clubs so dog-hungry for that win. And it was just chaos. It was yeah. awesome. I loved it. So, yeah, I think we love... We, I, I have a soft spot for Port for that reason. I have a soft spot for... GWS for that reason. You love an underdog then. Yeah, yeah. Just just anyone who everyone says mm. shouldn't exist because they're new. Because my club's new as well. Yeah, I suppose. And yeah. people try and denigrate them for that. I'm just like, no, people are trying to build new things. Just because it's been around forever yeah. doesn't mean it's inherently better or the best. That's all. Yeah, yeah. I like that. That's cool. Um, so being a Fremantle fan, we do... Well, we, we do get a lot of Fremantle perspectives on this show. I'm sure. just starting to realise that. The, the, the viewers must just think like everyone in Perth is a, a Frio fan because like most of True Footy's Frio fans, I guess we had on the other day with oh, really? Lenny's Frio fans. Yeah. I have so many West Coast fans yeah. on mine. Oh, so many of my guests are West Coast fans. Right. All the time, like Caleb is, uh, Soph Hawkins has been on mine before. Yep. She's a West Coast fan. Yeah, right. Who was the lady? That, was it the one that worked for 6PR? Yeah, Soph Hawkins. That was her? Yeah, yeah. yeah that was a really Shout good episode. Soph. Yeah, she's really good. Um, she's what's, awesome. What's yeah. her background? Sorry, just a little segue, but I'm actually really interested. Oh, so she, she's media and communications. <laughs> yeah, like, okay. She, she knows so much about so many different kinds she, of sports. Like, she's yeah. making her career in that. She's making her name in that. Yeah. And she's killing it in that. So she that's was really path. knowledgeable. Yeah. She's that great. Was and she used to write for The Yarn as well, which is... Oh, and we okay. went to uni together and stuff like that. Right. So she used to write really great articles for us across lots and lots of different sports. EPL, footy, yeah. anything like that. That's cool. You've got a pretty good guest list, like, backed up there. Yeah, we, we were sourcing them back in the day and I just yeah. Yeah, held in contact with them. But yeah, all good mates of mine, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Um, so with regard to uh, Fremantle, I think my viewers would be, um, or at least the Fremantle supporting ones would be a little disappointed if I didn't ask you, what's your view on the whole coaching change at Fremantle? Were you a Ross fan? I know you've outspoken about this on your own show, but as sure. a chance to uh, speak about it for the true footy listeners. Yeah, um, if you want to talk about Fremantle, I'll talk about it till the cows come home. <laughs> One thing I'll say about me I've realised as a fan is... I like to hope I'm quite balanced. Like I like lots of things about the club and I also don't like lots of things. And I hope that I balance that out pretty well. I'm in lots of group chats with Frio fans who are sort of just like, like Frio fundamentalists. Like they believe everything that the club does is like the best possible thing in the entire world. Yeah. And that kind of grates me a little bit because not every club, like there's lots of things that lots of clubs do mm. badly. So I'd like to think I have a balanced view on it. But in terms of the coaching change, number one, I really like Justin Longmuir. Yeah. But the reason I like him is not because he's a Frio guy. Like, okay. I, that doesn't really factor into it for me at all. I like him because he was an accomplished assistant coach at West Coast, where he coached their forward line to their 2015 grand final. And I love the fact that he was their backline coach at Collingwood, 
who coached that defensive unit to a grand final as well. That shows to me that he is actually a really good coach, irrespective of what club he's come from before. Because if everyone says, oh, he's a Frio guy, we need a Frio guy, he's yeah. just Frio ways. I was like, those teams stunk. Yeah. I watched those teams. I want no part of what those teams were about to infiltrate my new team. So I'm all in on that. I think he was the best person for the job. Super happy that we got him. At the same time, I was a Ross guy. You know what I mean? Weird. Because I, well, put it like this. I was a Ross guy because that version of Fremantle was the best version of Fremantle I ever saw in my life. Like so much of Fremantle under Harvey, under Conley, you didn't know what they played like. I remember my brothers kind of looking at me like, what style of footy do we play? And I was like, I have honestly no idea. Yeah. And for those years with Ross, he made it so simple and he was just like, you knew what you were getting from those teams every single week. They commanded respect. Sometimes they commanded a bit of fear which you never thought as a Frio fan you would instill in people. You never thought people would be sitting there as Hawthorne fans being like, you know, we've got to go to Subi and play Frio. That's going to be bloody <laughs> tough. Normally it's like, yeah, quick W and we'll get the hell out of here. Like, that's what I loved about him. And so much of that place became really toxic from what I've read. I don't know if a lot of that was, was because of him. I think he didn't have the best medical staff. People mm-hmm. were being injured a lot. I don't think he had the best assistant coaches that people particularly liked. I don't think Steve Rostich and stuff did him any favors by weirdly becoming the list manager and then offering Lockie Neal mm. that he should stay because they'll fire Shane Kirsten tomorrow. Like those are all really weird moves. And the thing is, I loved about Ross as well is he has a lot of empathy. Uh, you know, like the day he got fired, he was on his way to hang out with Harley Bennell to talk to him about career moves that he could take. He was always really sticking up for the young indigenous guys anytime someone tried to hang crap on them and stuff like that. Like I really loved. That he was a like he was looked like a tough dad, you know what I mean? Like he was a tough but fair dad, and I loved that about him. And I think the players loved him as well. I get why it was time to move on, but I have such an attachment to that team, and I don't think he was to blame for a lot of the problems that we had because recruiters went into that. I think a lot of the players who were drafted went into that. Injuries I think also went to that. Injuries went into that, and that goes to some of the medical staff too. The whole apparatus and stuff like that around him with Rossich, that didn't become good and Bell coming in. I don't know how much of the problem was actually him as a coach. And also, to be honest, I've said this on my podcast before, I think the West Australian have pivoted into the West Australian newspaper really have pivoted into since they now have to pay for content and things like that. I don't mm. think they're anti free mail. I don't buy into that so much, but I think they thought we can get a story out of this yeah. and we can really start to hammer him. And, you know, the day he was fired, they put up a, a wanted ad for the next coach, like someone who can teach kicking. I'm like, I'm sure he was trying to teach him how to kick. No coach is like, you know what sucks? Kicking. I hate it. You know what I mean? So look, I'm conflicted about it, but, I mean, on J-Lo, I think he's an accomplished coach from what I've seen. And I'm really keen to see how this year plays out, even when it's going to be like Cam McCarthy on a wing or whatever weird stuff we're going to throw at teams. <laughs> That's cool. I like it. It's an interesting point you make about um, picking the, the Fremantle person as well. I remember when the Eagles replaced Bushart, we came down to Sumich. Um, Scott Burns, I think, was one of them. And um, is that my cat meowing? Oh, yeah. He's just under here. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I have a very noisy cat. What's up, cat? Um, Sorry, came down to Sumich and Simpson were basically the final two for the Eagles job. And uh, if you made the case for picking the Eagles guy, we would have gone with Sumich. And then look at Simpson. Simpson's become, he's on track to be up there with Malthouse as one of the most successful Eagles uh, coaches. It should his career sort of go the way it's going. Obviously, there's no guarantee of a second flag. But my point is that sometimes you have to look past the whole um, sentimental side of it and pick, uh, picking the uh, you've the got to go best guy. available and exactly. the same thing with the draft as well if I had to hear yeah. one more uh, article about how Fremantle need to pick Devin Robertson because he's from uh, yeah. WA I'm just like he's not the best available player yeah. if he was from another state we wouldn't be having this conversation and I get it people say he'll leave or maybe Adam Simpson would have left you know go back to the kangaroos mm. you have to back yourself as any sport organisation that you can guarantee that you'll build a, a good enough club and a good enough successful strategy that those guys, wherever they're from, will want to stay. Matthew Pavlich's parents were begging Fremantle not to draft him. His mum was crying, saying he'll be back here in two years. Yeah. And we saw how that played out. You know, I mean, you've got to back yourself in. Yeah. And I think West Coast did. They didn't just go with the safe option of Sumich. They went with someone who was interstate because they thought he was the best guy. And, I mean, the proof is in the pudding, right? That's right. Exactly. You don't want to compromise your strategy for, this, for fear of the fact that 
it might not go uh, well, like um, players might leave. And Gold Coast are doing the same thing. Um, yeah, absolutely. People were talking about them taking the King Twins at pick one and two when, you know, the coaches and Rankin were available or whatever it was. Um, yeah, I think it was one and two. Um, and obviously, Ben King looks like an absolute gun. Don't get me wrong. They, totally. ended, up, they ended up with him anyway. Um, but yeah, I, I do think, I, I do strongly agree with you that you just got to pick the best available. So using that segue into the draft, um, obviously this time of year, there's not a whole lot of football current events to talk about, but one of them is the draft. It's kind of current. It was a few weeks ago. That's current enough. Um, from a Fremantle perspective, they had uh, Langdon and Hill leave the club this offseason. R.I.P. But, uh, yeah, but three top 10 picks have entered the club in Hayden Young, Liam Henry, and Caleb Sarong. Um, hol- holistically, I guess, how do you feel about Fremantle's offseason and um, where, where they're placed for next year? Were you happy with the... I guess you can't really help Hill and Langdon leaving, so were you happy overall at the end product? That's the thing, hey... It's so hard to sort of assess because in the last two years, we've lost Lockie Neal and Brad Hill. And you think about if we had it brought in, I mean, we, we wouldn't have got all the people that we got without that, but it's hard mm. to look past the fact that two recent Doig medalists are yeah. out the door. So I was on balance pretty, pretty happy. I mean, I think there was a bit too much maneuvering at the top. Like, I don't love the James H signing. Yeah. I mean, we got is part of the, the Brad Hill trade was amazing in the end. I mean, just looking at it here, we got pick 10, a future second, a future fourth, Blake Akers, and pick 58. Like, that is a lot to get for Brad Hill. But then to trade away a bunch of that stuff for James H to mm. eat his contract, like, I don't think he's going to be a huge difference maker as a player. I hope he proves me wrong. We have to pay him quite a lot of money for him to be at the club. Like, he's on a lot of money, and that's why we got him, because Colin were able to offload that money. And that future second that we got, which is a really good pick, that could be in the 20s or something like that. Yeah. That's just gone straight over to them. And also you think about if we had have actually accepted their original offer of pick six, which I don't mind that we didn't do, but then we wouldn't have had to do all that maneuvering to get up to pick eight yeah. and lose another future second, which we got for Langdon, to move up two spots to avoid the Liam Henry trade. We would have had six and seven anyway. But the funny thing about that is, so we, I, I don't like it from that point of view because I don't love Aish. And we also compromised next year's draft by getting rid of all these future seconds that we were able to bring in because they were probably good picks and could have been used in the Liam Henry bid. But at the same time, Hayden Young is a steal Mm. and he looks awesome. We had no right to draft that guy. He looks like a million bucks. And I think when I'm looking at my list and I'm sort of like, well, who's my next superstar? I hope Chera and Brayshaw might prove something to me. I don't know if Brayshaw is necessarily a superstar, I'm looking at that like, who's the next guy coming through who's going to take that mantle from Mundy and Fife and Sonny Walters? Because we've been leaning on them a lot for a long time. And I look at someone like Hayden Young and I'm like, I reckon it's him. I reckon he is going to be an absolute stud. I love Liam Henry. I bought one of his ties recently, tied to culture. Oh, yeah. Purple yeah. tie, got it all going on as soon as he was drafted. I was like, that's nice. my guy. Got to get in on that. Good Christchurch boy as well, which is fun. Um, yeah. It all lives and dies to me on Sarong. Yeah, that's right. Because right. I actually wanted us to take Flanders. When Flanders dropped, I was like, one, two, go those two. I really wanted Dylan Stephenson yeah. outside run, but he was gone. <laughs> he was off the board. And they, they committed just wrong. They love him because he's inside nut. He has great leadership qualities. And I think he was someone who probably said in the interview to them, like, I'll, I'll, I want to be here. And I'm mm. friends with Hayden Young. They had to yeah. hurriedly interview Hayden Young because they didn't think he was going to drop to them. True. So they're like, oh, we've got to go interview this guy. Yeah. find out if he wants to come here or not. <laughs> Hayden, was it? Yeah, exactly. So I love those three, but I think it lives and dies on him. If Sarong ends up being good, if those Robbie Gray comparisons are true, that's looking really, really, really fun. And my big thing about our list for a long time is we have no pressure forwards. We have yeah. no one in that Richmond mold who can actually lay forward pressure. Brandon Matera doesn't want to know about what tackling is, even though he's an awesome goal kicker. Sonny Walters doesn't know, want to know what tackling is. He's doing much better things than that. That's why we were playing like Switkowski and Collier. And these guys we were trying to put... We put Brayshaw in the forward line. We were like, mm. try to harass some people. And guys like... Uh, Sarong and Liam Henry could be really good at that. So I'm excited for that, but I don't love the stuff that we had to ship out to move all the other pieces around so much. Like the Aish thing, yeah. the the how much we had to give up for Henry because we didn't keep a lot of those picks. I don't mm. love that. But those three guys, like, I love them. I wish we had got Flanders, but I get why they went with Sarong. Yeah, good call. Interesting. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, the age thing was weird from my perspective. You'd think if you're doing Collingwood a favour with regard to salary, you'd probably get more of a discounted price than a future second. It is a hefty price to pay. Well, it was a second and a third and we got back. A second and a fourth and we got back a third. But still, oh, okay. like that future second, like that's, yes. that's a good Significant, pick. yeah. Great pick. It's kind of smacks of a, like almost like a top-up player. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like a play when, you're, when you feel like you're ready to go and play finals next year. Maybe Fremantle internally feel like that and they needed to replace that outside run. But yeah, I agree with you. That was a bit wild. He's not a great user. Yeah, if you exactly. Look at his stats. Yeah. He's not a great user, and if you can, you can run all you want, right? But if you spray the footy into the forward line, it's not going to help anyone. Yes, yes, I agree with you. Um, one one thing I've always thought about Fremantle is yes, they're in a bad situation with players leaving. I've always thought they've been pretty savvy at, at making the best of a bad situation trade wise. So if you look at how they turn Neil into Logan, uh, Logan and Hob, <laughs> Logan and Hob, my guys. <laughs> There's a t-shirt idea. Um, <laughs> Hogan and Lobb, um, and then this year obviously turned it into three top 10 picks. Um, that's pretty significant, but I guess I think it's kind of like a product of, I think it's kind of a reality now where with this advent of free agency and, and all this uh, increased movement and stuff like that, that rebuilding teams, particularly interstate, are going to have a, have trouble holding on to their players. Now, I guess mm. Fremantle's, I mean, that didn't stop Neil leaving. He's South Australian, um, Hills, West Australian. So that's maybe not the interstate factor there. But I, I honestly just think that's the issue facing... I mean, look at Brisbane. Okay, so a couple of years ago, they couldn't hold on to a single player. Um, and then now they're a good side. They're actually becoming a destination club. Totally. People are requesting trades to them. The same will happen to the Gold Coast if they can turn around like Brisbane. That's a big if, I know. Um, so I, for Fremantle, it's just I feel like they... You want to embrace a proper rebuild where you're actually getting the high draft picks. You're picking your Hayden Youngs and stuff like that, but you've also got to battle that with if we're shit for too much longer. Um, and when I say shit, you only had one bottom four finish in the last yeah, three it's years. Kind it's kind of frustrating in a weird way because it's not shit enough yeah. for me to get a number one pick, and I yeah. really love a number one pick. Although you did get two for Weller. That, oh, that's that kind of that kind of cut makes it but up. But now that draft looks a little bit weaker than other ones. Like the the draft two drafts ago with, you know, Rankin and stuff like that. Imagine yeah. if you had two and five in that. Yeah, true. I mean, in this one, it was Chera and Brayshaw, who I hope are going to be very good players. But, you mm. know, the other players now are Paddy Dow. Yeah. Davis Uniki. We yeah. haven't seen too much from those guys. True. Cam Rayner, I mean, everyone was trying to talk him up in the Brisbane finals, but, I mean, he's not ready. Yeah, for that's that. right. He's not ready for that smoke yet, as they say. Yeah. So, yeah. The that's thing right. I'm interested in as well for Fremantle point of view is we haven't seen our two draft picks from last year. We haven't seen Sam Sturt. True. And we haven't seen Luke Valenti. Valenti, that's the and one. There, yeah. I, I'm really keen to see if and when they fit into the mix. True. They seem kind of like more long-term options in yeah. the sense that Sturt's a bit more of a pro, uh, what's the word project player, and then Valenti's obviously like an inside ball winner, so he's not going to come in from both day one. Both need to get bigger, and both need to figure out where they're at. 100%. Exactly. But Valenti was a really good one. I, I really wanted for the Eagles. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, we we, we actually chose someone over him. Um, so obviously, we just didn't have him in our plans. But that's all right. Mm. I, I'll forgive you, Wesco. <laughs> um, just the last touching point on Fremantle. Before we move on, what is the hope in terms of um, where are they placed for next year, and like, what's the premiership window? Like, when is that coming? What's what's the target anyway? That's a really interesting question. So, Champion Data has us listed as the second worst list in the competition. Do you rate Champion Data though? No, I have big problems with Champion Data, but yeah. I more have problems with Champion Data because they keep all of their data secret from fans like us. Right? Yeah. They spoon feed us who elite is, but they won't tell us necessarily what elite means yeah, that's and true. what the qualifications are. So we can't sit there and actually interrogate any of that and figure mm. out why that's good. Because, I mean, just for this example, Melbourne were rated as the number one list last year for champion data. Mm -hmm. They were rated the best one in the entire competition. This year, they're 12th. Now, yeah, how so much, what? <laughs> how much changed in that year yeah, yeah. that you dropped that much and they can sit there and be like, yeah, we weren't wrong about that. Yeah, that's true. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're doing those, themselves a disservice Those are sense. very reactionary to what happened the year before. Otherwise, their prediction would have said, actually, Brisbane's going to rise up the ladder. Yeah. There's a strong case for that. So I don't read too much into that. And also, we're below Carlson, which I have a big problem yeah, with. because That's, that's bullshit. That's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, it doesn't factor in time, players that are injured. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When right. you I mean, Alex Pierce was in all Australia contention, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But I don't think we're going to play finals. I hope we do. I hope it's like a 2010 situation where it's like mm. the baby docker movement and suddenly yeah. Chera and Brayshaw go, actually, with two preseasons, we're going to smash and crash through the middle. And other players like Brett Bewley, we're hearing a lot of hype about. He goes, actually, I can take on that Ed Langdon role and fill it really well in a way you hadn't heard of before. And suddenly yeah. these three draft picks from this year, they all play really high-quality footy. 
the window is not now. The window is in the future for us. I don't think it's anything close to now, but there is one thing that hangs really heavy over that, and that's Nat Five. True. I mean, this is a guy who has not played finals footy in the prime of his career. He hasn't played finals footy from the ages of 24 to 28. Next year, he'll be 29. That's a tough road for a guy who is literally the best player currently in the competition. Now, we can quibble over that, but he's a Brownlow medalist. And that, I reckon that clock has been making Fremantle make different moves for a while, not just fully recommit to the draft. That's why they've done their little bring it in because they have this guy. And to a lesser extent, they've got Sonny Walters in the prime of his career. But I worry what's happened that we've wasted this guy's career. And I really hope that next year we go, hey, Nat Fife, it was all worth it because look at this team we're rolling out. But what I worry is that the future for us is actually longer term. That really it'll be once those guys like Chera, Brayshaw, Sarong, Sturt are all in their prime that will actually see us achieve that promised land. Because unfortunately in footy, one guy can't influence everything the most. There are 22 other blokes out there. It's not basketball. It's not a quarterback in football. That's right. But I think it's longer term, but I really want us to surprise everyone this year. I really want us to come out and be like, actually, last year's beginning wasn't a fluke. Yeah. Yes, we've lost Brad Hill. We got all these new guys in and suddenly we're just running and running and running. New coach, that's what I hope. But I fear it's a longer term. I, I hope what will happen is, best case scenario, Fife wins it when he's like 31 playing as a full forward or something. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? All those yeah. young guys have taken the mantle. That would be cool. I like it. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, so... We'll move on to maybe some general predictions for next year. Let's go. Uh, because my viewers love this shit. Predictions videos on YouTube go bang. <laughs> but, um, Boy, but, have I got hot takes for you, viewers. <laughs> um, but specifically, we, we obviously don't have time to do a whole full league one. But um, if we could look at the top of the table, yep. the ladder rather, um, do you agree that... Uh, I think there's my dad coming home, but that's all right. Just ignore him. Um, do, you, do you agree that Richmond's the clear number one going into next season? No, I do not. Really? I think they are definitely 1A and 1B would be the West Coast Eagles. Interesting. I believe in the West Coast Eagles last year. I thought that they were the best team. We did a they, podcast where you were con- trying to convince me that the Eagles were actually yeah. like a contender and I was like, nah, nah, nah. And they, and, they, and they had that one bad game that I still think ruined everything, that Hawthorne yeah. game, right? I think yeah. that was the one. Otherwise, they were in the box seat. And they had played Richmond the week before, <clears throat> excuse me, and they had won in one of the best games of footy of the year. Mm. Richmond had, but that had nothing, that didn't make me think any less of West Coast. It was in the wet, it was a crazy last quarter. Is it the G too? So. Yeah, the G and the siren happened to sound when Richmond kicked the goal. I think those two are neck and neck, especially with Tim Kelly. Like, you got Tim Kelly in your team now, man. Like, come on with that. That's <laughs> awesome. It doesn't always happen that you improve by that much if you get a good play. And I, I actually. But there's one worry I have for West Coast. Okay. Josh Kennedy. I have the opposite opinion, but I'll let you speak. I'm just worried that, because we know that uh, players of that age, they fall off a cliff fast. Someday True. someone will be good. And then you'll say, and I thought the stuff about him was overblown a bit last year. I thought he was fine. Okay. But I look at that forward line and when there'll be no Rioli, and mm. then if you lose Josh Kennedy, suddenly there's a lot of attention on Darling. And even though I like Oscar Allen, he is not Josh Kennedy. Sure. He is not that kind of guy. And so I worry for that aspect of them. But West Coast have proved before that their midfield can win in premierships. And this is a goddamn good midfield. I am actually more concerned about Rioli out than Kennedy. All oh, right, well, I'm concerned about both. I should say the forward sure. line generally. Sure. Yeah, yeah. For Kennedy, for me, the reason I have some optimism in that respect is because going to the games last year, Dad and I were looking at Kennedy and going, you are playing shit. And he still turned out a 50 goal season. His, his <laughs> short leads to get space are ridiculous. Yeah. He'll just do these tiny little leads that only feel like they've been 15 metres. And he's got 20 metres on his yeah. man somehow every single time. I don't think I see him take contested marks because he beats his man so often. Yeah. Ridiculous. But going True. to my, my top four, I have here. Uh, so I think those two are 1A, 1B. I think Richmond are up there. I doubted them last year. I never should have. Uh, I've got Richmond, West Coast, GWS. I still think this is the best version of GWS we've seen. I think they're angry. I think they're tough. And more than anything, I think... Like, all their players are still there. And they're still all in the prime, prime of their career. In fact, you could argue they're just sort of reaching that time. They're reaching out. And also, let's just say they got Tom Green recently and they got Lockie Ash. Like, they're still getting high picks, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. It's ridiculous how they just turn in this new time. making it happen out there. So I think they're going to be in the mix for the premiership. And the other guys I have, I I reckon Melbourne might be back. Wow. I think Melbourne might be back. I know there's a lot of buzz around the Bulldogs and stuff like that. I'm not fully buying that. Number two on champion data. Number two on champion data. But I watched them get absolutely smashed off the park by GWS and week one. I look at their defense. I'm just like, I remember watching in the game and being like, who is matched up on Jeremy Cameron out there? 
it's some poor, it's Eastern Wood, like who's a good player just trying to do his best. And I'm like, that's not, that's not good, man. Mm. That's not good at all. So they're my, they're my four. Interesting. Okay. Who, who you got? I on the spot. Yeah, yeah on the spot. I actually, yeah. <laughs> I agree. I think Richmond West Coast is the grand final that we've been waiting for. Yeah. And I'll be disappointed if it's not the case. So I will cheekily put my team one and two. GWS is a strong candidate. Uh, the only thing that makes me nervous about them is the f- there's a stat about it when you get belted in finals the next sure, season you don't win yeah. a final and I know stats are just stats but I do kind of find it compelling but I don't know I think on the balance of it I'd still say the fact that the, all those players are coming into their prime um, there's enough talent there it's just it's I guess it's about the mentality of the squad where it's at um, in terms of recovering from that that belting but um, all things being equal I probably have them third. Mm-hmm. The fourth one's a tricky one. Yeah, it is. I don't want to say the Bulldogs, even though I, I actually really rate them. Yeah, I like lots of their players. For yeah. Sure. Who have I got in the ball? Ah, you know, I've got it. This is a really boring answer because okay. this is pretty, probably like everyone's top four from can last I year. Can I guess it? Can I see if I can guess it? Yeah. Is it Collingwood? Yeah. Well, yeah. Collingwood. <laughs> okay. well, they're a good team. I've, I've talked them up a lot as well. Okay. Um, I think they might be a case of Geelong a couple of years ago where they recruited all this new talent, didn't quite know how to optimize it. So we got Tim Kelly and this is Geelong, got G- a Gablet back into the side, didn't quite know how all those pieces fit together. Mm. And then we saw in 2019, they really turned it on and found their, uh, hit their straps. Collingwood had sort of Beans come into their midfield this year. And I know he missed it with a lot of injuries. Oh, he missed like half a year or He's something actually, like that. He's uh, actually just today... Ruled out footy indefinitely. Okay. Does that does that change that, your? I don't know if it would. Ch- I, I don't, don't think it changes. Too it doesn't much, push so. them out of the top four for me, but I just think there's enough quality there for them to be around the mark, and I would probably still have them ahead of the Bulldogs. I wasn't convinced by Collingwood that much in 2019. I felt like they still had another couple of gears to go to. Mm. Um, so I think I, I'll, I'll back them into improving okay. and and um, be around the mark again. Can I have a Can I have a big call? Yes, quickly? I would love a big call from you. Geelong will not play finals in 2020. Why? Because let's just look at their list, right? They they did some smart stuff, though. I must admit this. They realized they had a window, and so mm-hmm. they recruited a lot of mature age guys. They got their Brian Myers, still the worst name in footy. Shout out, Brian. Um, they had Tim Kelly come in, who is now gone. They drafted guys like Charlie Constable, things like that, who are never going to be A graders, but also are not even playing footy and apparently are trying to make their way out of the club as we speak. And who do they get this year? They got Josh Jenkins. Great. Awesome. Love that for them. <laughs> um, but the thing is, they have... Again, we talk about when players reach a certain age, you can drop off a cliff very, very quickly, sometimes without warning. And they have Tom Hawkins, Joel Selwood. Patrick Dangerfield is older than people think. He's probably turning 31 next year. He did just have an amazing season where he narrowly missed out on the brown line. He's the best bird. He's the, one, he's the only thing I'm saying that he will prop them up. Harry sure. Taylor, that guy is sure. certainly on the way out. Who else am I missing? I'm probably missing other ones. And I just and now that you've got Tim Kelly, who really was their ace, their midfield ace in true, there. True, true. And they're, they're all old and they're all going to go very, very soon. And so I look, if you don't have Hawkins, Selwood and Taylor at their very, very, very best... Who am I relying on to win football games? Mitch Duncan, fantastic outside player. Career best season. Career best season. And Patrick Dangerfield and Tom Stewart for mine. Yeah, Everyone awesome. else below that I feel like are very system players who could potentially be exposed when the going gets tough. I mean, am, I, am I really going to back Blitzars in for a second year of holding down a key post at fullback? Personally, me, I don't, I don't necessarily see that happening. And also... Their draft picks are quite a way away from actually being able to come in and really help that team. And so I just worry about next year that if they start poorly and they get some injuries from those guys, the wheels could just fall off them completely. And so I do worry about them not only for next year, but more so for long term yeah. after that. Yeah. Fair enough. I um at the risk of just debating your big call, <laughs> which is kind of a bit futile. But I, I personally think they've got one more year left in them. I yeah. think they, I think they'll go around again. Um I think I know, that's why it's a big call. I'm not I, like I just yeah no 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 that's that's know. a good call. It's a good call. Well, they, yeah, they, they finished first, so it is a big call. Mm. Um, Kelly out is huge. I think Stephen coming in, even though he's older, uh, I think it mitigates a little bit enough for them to not miss finals. I do think what they've done he's is been good on bad teams for a long, true, long time. True. Yeah. 
Um, and now Seb Ross has <laughs> uh, stepped up into that um, sort of Jack Stephen role where he's oh my god, uh, I think I had team. St Kilda as the worst list in the competition last year, and yeah. I still don't rate it now. I mean, Brad Hill's a gun. I mean, I know from experience watching that guy every single week, he can seriously play. He's their best player now. Exactly, but you're trying to sell me on oh, Paddy Wright is an elite player and he's going to turn it around. And it's like I don't see it, man. I didn't yeah. see him doing that for Port or anything like that, especially because mm. he's very old now. And all the Dougal Howard chatter. I mean, I watch mm. a lot of footy as you do. He might be fine, but I was never watching a port game like, oh man, this Dougal Howard is definitely worth a first round pick. I tell you that much. True. Where does all that come from? But anyway, that's another. I think time. there was a lot of internal sort of discontent with port fans about that because he was a contracted player and he was seen as sort of the next generation. I get that. I totally get that. Yeah. And as I say, I don't watch him as closely as other people. Uh, I, again, Port is just total wild card for me. Every single year, what's what's going to happen with Port? They could jump up, they could jump down. You know, yeah. Well, one thing is, I love the three guys they bought in last year. Dersma, yes, Spiders, yeah. and especially Rosé. Yeah, yeah. Bloody guns. And they've added four top 25 picks this year. I don't know if they'll come in and as quickly make the same impact as Dersma and Rosie, but nonetheless, they're a team like Geelong who have planned really well for this yeah. rebuild on the fly. And that sort of goes to what I was saying to you before about the dangers of going through a deep rebuild and mm. then literally spending years at the bottom of the ladder. I think for like Port and Geelong and what's becoming the new way, and West Coast did it a couple of years ago, is you, you try and get an influx of these draft picks while you're not a terrible team. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's really smart. Any other bold predictions for 2020? It's not so much bold, but I reckon that Marcus Bontempelli will win the Brownlow next year. Interesting. I think there's a lot of... Not only is he good enough as a player, there's a lot of narrative stuff around the Bulldogs now. They're rated super highly. People think they had a good trade period. If he comes out for the first few games like a house on fire, I reckon he's going to be the person to beat. I reckon. I think the other guys, I think, are GWS guys, but I think they'll all take votes off each other. Whitfield, Cornelio, and Kelly yeah. are all primed in some way to mm. absolutely crush it. That's true. I guess Bond's got McRae, but yeah, I agree. He's probably the main man McRae there. McRae ain't stealing votes, though, and I you love think McRae. Didn't I think, he poll quite well? I think so, but I just mean, like, I, I love him, but he's sure. in and under. I think Bond is so flashy and yeah. kicks goals and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I like it. He's a good candidate. He, him and Cripps feel like the next. Oh, Cri yeah, Cripps. Yeah. Is good well, Cripps is never really going to have too many people stealing votes. Which uh, I think is always going to hold him in good stead. Uh, so, how dare you put some respect on Zach Fisher's name? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, sorry. <laughs> um, cool, man. So, um, because it's basically the end of the year, should we rattle off? Uh, well, I say you because I haven't prepared it because <laughs> I, I prepared the question. Um, well, what are some memories from 2019 that you can rattle off from us that were some of your favorite moments this year? Totally. Number one, I was down in Canberra where we beat the Giants. Oh, wow. In a way, I never thought that was excellent. Seeing Hogan and Alex Pierce up close and how hard they were working, that was really cool. I was in a pool in Bali watching it on a big screen smashing cocktails. I, even <laughs> I was having a good time. I think you were having a better time than I was, that's for damn sure. Yeah. Uh, the, weirdly, the Aaron Norton game. Oh yeah. Who yeah. did he dismantle there? Was it the was it the kangaroos? Or I can't something actually like remember. That? I can't but remember either, but he I remember did watching live just going, Yeah. This guy is absolutely incredible. I remember It wasn't that. Geelong, was it? It might it may have actually been. Because they, they upset Geelong. had, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh that was really, really big, I remember. Yeah. And anything to do with Sonny Walters, man. That yeah. guy kicking those two one was a point, True. the other one was a huge I mean, we beat Collingwood before the bye yeah. at the G. Exactly. Yeah. I mean the world was turned upside down there yeah. for a while. It True. Was, Awesome, awesome. And the other one was the preliminary final, GWS, uh, Collingwood. I was there in a pub watching it. I was half cut, having the best time in a pub in Western Sydney. And they and the place was rocking. It was really, really cool. And that game was so suspenseful. And then GWS won and I was wearing a GWS jersey. <laughs> and I just like, some guys looked at me in the crowd like this. And I looked at him and was like, <laughs> hugging each other, like jumping <laughs> up and down. That was a... a Big time memory. I love that. We went back to that same pub the next week and I declared very foolishly that I was going to do a shot every time Toby Green kicked a goal. <laughs> and I was sober as hell by the end yeah. of that day. So they were, they were probably the big ones. Yeah. Nice. Absolutely. Oh, that's a great memory. I would have been shocked if you didn't include a GWS memory in that. So Got to do yeah. it. It was a wild ride. Big, yeah. big sound from the west of the town. You know? That's it. Yeah, that, that meme. Um, cool, man. So um, I'm just aware that we've lost a camera because this podcast has gone really long, which I, I really enjoyed it. Um, so, but maybe just some passing question, uh, parting questions for you. Um, if you had any sort of advice, and this is just deviating really, really quickly from all the topics we just discussed, but yeah. back to just your you as a creator in general, um, and we talked about how this sort of space is in its infancy. Do you have any advice for like someone who might be thinking about starting up uh, like a podcast or a YouTube channel in the AFL media or anything like that? Do you, is there anything you've learned 
um, that you would sort of impart? Yeah, um, don't be a Dockers fan, number <laughs> one, because that's a rough road and when you have to cover footy all the time and cover your team. No, um, That was my first thing. I was like, <laughs> don't be a Dockers don't fan. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, I reckon it's build something small and sustainable first because yep. the way those algorithms work and the way we want to consume content, you've got to be bringing that out every week, if not every day or every second day. And I too often think I have a great idea and I do it for four weeks and realize I'm gassed Mm. and then I just let it slide. And I think it's really important to build your model in something that you can bake into your own routine as you've done and you'll be able to roll that out week after week, even on days you don't feel like it, even on days where the goings on in the league aren't that big or anything like that, building your model so you can just constantly be able to put that content out and the more reps you get in, the more easier it will become that then you can start to do more innovative, different, cool, whatever stuff you want to do. So I think that's a big part of it. Starting in a way that you can bake it into your routine and start to get your reps in and not try to bite off too much too early. Because suddenly you'll realize a bunch of time has gone past and out of nowhere you've got a viewership or a readership. Yeah. And then you can really start to treat those people to cool things once you know that you can do this for the long term. I love that. And you will also get quicker at doing the basic stuff really quickly. So if you, like you say, if you try and do like massive production straight away, it's going to be not sustainable really. Um, The other thing I've noticed as well is uh, not setting yourself up for, in the same way, like one thing I've noticed that other young YouTubers have done or like new YouTubers in particular is like they'll do try and do 18 season previews for different teams. And so you see they'll start with Adelaide Crows, three days later, a Brisbane Lion video, then Carlton, they're going alphabetically and then they just stop because they get bored at doing the Collingwood one. Oh, do, man. do you know what I mean? The so, Western Bulldogs <laughs> never getting anything. Yeah, right. exactly right. I, I've seen that quite a lot. So I guess it goes to what you were saying about yeah. not biting off more than you can chew and just, just keeping it fun at first as well. Do you, is online negativity a thing for you? Because I've been doing this obviously a couple of years. I was speaking to the pair a little bit about it. Um, do you, do you cop anything? I can't imagine why you would. I'll, I'll say that. But, you know, you know what people on the internet A are. little bit. I think everyone does who yeah. puts something up there, you get a little bit. And I think it's just, I don't know, it's important to, we focus on the negative too much, but a lot of people yeah. always come through with positive things to say, especially from people who don't know you as well. And it's just important to hold on to those because yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm can be quite sensitive, I'll, I'll admit, and sometimes those yeah. things will affect me quite a lot. Mm. And the good things that come through just wash over me. And yeah. I, I forget about them two seconds later. Yeah. And it's important to keep those because they are just as important, in fact, more important, but we don't give them the same weight. 100%. So I think it's just important to constantly keep remembering that. Yeah, good call. That's a really good answer. The reason I ask people that is because I think it's just an important message for people to hear because we're all going to cop the negative stuff. And I, like I said in last week's podcast, I don't. it doesn't bother me anywhere near as much as it used to. Occasionally, I'll get like one that's quite an intelligent comment and it's like a criticism. I'll be like, damn, yeah. that hurt, man. <laughs> but generally speaking, no, it's been pretty good. So, yeah, cool. um, But anyway, Christian, thank you so much for joining us on the True Footy Podcast. This has been a ripper episode. Whoops, even though we've um, we've lost one of the cameras. but yeah, that, it went too long, killed the camera. Yeah, no. Uh, that's all good this was really fun um to wrap it up why don't you just remind all our viewers where they can find you um in terms of your podcast and your social medias uh, why don't you just give yourself a little plug sure thing so we're the ruck rover podcast we'll be coming back both on youtube form and in our podcast past form in 2020 you can find us just the ruck rover afl podcast or even just the ruck rover type that into google anything and on your uh apps and things like that you'll find us pretty easily uh, our handles on Instagram, we're at the Ruck Rover, and we're the same thing as that on Facebook and on Twitter. We are Ruck Rover Pod. So please go check us out. Give us a like, give us a follow. Also, check it out because not only do we have our podcast up there, we have a really great artist who does some illustrations for us, who is shout out to Joel Ebsworth of Two Weird Kids. He does weekly cartoons for us on our Instagram and Facebook. He's super great to follow him as well. Loves this footy, loves a nice cartoon and uh, shout out to him as well. So lots of different content on the Ruck Rover for 2020. We're going to try to put out there for you. I love it. And I, uh, I'm not just saying it when I fully endorse going to check out his channel and, uh, and the art, which I forgot to mention as well, is one of my favorite parts of your, um, of your setup. So again, thank you so much uh, to everyone who's listened to the end of the episode. Thank you. Um, don't forget, we're also on iTunes and Spotify. Um, and also, if you haven't checked it out, I did a podcast during the week with the pair for the Port Adelaide YouTube channel. Thanks, Christian. Thank we'll you. See you all next time.